July 7th, 2021 morning session of the City Council. Good morning, Keelan, please call the roll. Good morning, Mayor. Good morning, Commissioners. Hardesty. Here. Maps. Here. Rubio. Here. Ryan Wheeler. Here. Under Portland City Code and State Law, the City Council is holding this meeting electronically. All members of the Council are attending remotely via video and teleconference, and the City's made several avenues available for the public to listen to the audio broadcast of this meeting. The meeting is available to the public on the City's YouTube channel, eGovPDX, www.portlandoregon.gov slash video, and channel 30. The public can also provide written testimony to the council by emailing the council clerk at cctestimony at portlandoregon.gov. The council is taking these steps as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic and the need to limit in-person contact and to promote physical distancing. The pandemic is an emergency that threatens the public health, safety, and welfare, which requires us to meet remotely by electronic communications. Thank you all for your patience, your flexibility, and your understanding as we continue to manage through these challenging circumstances to conduct the city's business. And with that, we'll hear from legal counsel on the rules of order and decorum. Good morning. Good morning. To participate in council meetings, you may sign up in advance with the council clerk's office for communications to briefly speak about any subject. You may also sign up for public testimony on resolutions or the first readings of ordinances. The published council agenda at portlandoregon.gov slash auditor contains information about how and when you may sign up for testimony while the city council is holding electronic meetings. Your testimony should address the matter being considered at the time. When testifying, please state your name for the record. Your address is not necessary. Please disclose if you are a lobbyist. If you're representing an organization, please identify it. The presiding officer determines the length of testimony. Individuals generally have three minutes to testify unless otherwise stated. When your time is up, the presiding officer will ask you to conclude. Disruptive conduct such as shouting, refusing to conclude your testimony when your time is up, or interrupting others' testimony or council deliberations will not be allowed. If there are disruptions, a warning will be given that further disruption may result in the person being placed on hold or ejected from the remainder of the electronic meeting. Please be aware that all council meetings are recorded. Thank you. First up is communications. First item, Keelan, is 528. Request of Edwin Hess to address council regarding property at 9442 Northeast 13th Avenue, 97211. We received notice from Edwin that they're canceling their request. Oh, all right. Next up then is 529. Next individual, please. Request of Evelyn Bross to address council regarding how to help homeless people and citizens of Portland. Good morning. Good morning, Mayor. Um, I just want to give you a rough draft of my example. What I have to tell you is um, is something that could really take in motion and, and go forward. Because like back in 2009, I was homeless. I saw a guy to have a unicycle pulled out. And I said, what are you doing? I said, can you ride that? And he showed me he could ride that unicycle. I said, do you know that you should... Um, dress up as a Scottish person and play the pipes and entertain the people in Portland. He goes, I'm learning how to do the pipes. I says, well, that's what you need to do is dress up as a Scottish person and go through town and, and entertain the people in Portland. That's how I believe the unit piper started. It's because I saw him in 2009 when I was homeless and I gave him that idea. I also, when I was younger, I had kids and I lived in low-income housing. I started... I started cleaning the parking lot and kids started helping me. I took them out for McDonald's for helping me. I started up a, a team. We, they had shirts. It's an Evelyn's Wednesday team. I made them cakes for their birthdays and everything else. And they got treats going out to eat. Um, and it was a, a success. But now I have something for you that I've been talking about since 2010-11. If I was mayor, but I won't vote, go over there. Um, how to get the city and homeless back up, back on path and help the citizens. Um, you need to work with the the owners of abandoned apartments. Um, they are an eyesore, but they're also a solution. These apartments can be turned into 
one of those apartments could be turned into at least two apartments each, have, have a licensed construction person, um, an electrician, a plumber, a carpenter, so on, and then have citizens of Portland who have knowledge in those fields work underneath these people. Now, these citizens of Portland work underneath these licensed people, get these um, abandoned buildings and everything up and running and get them into smaller apartments. And these people are volunteering their time. They're not being paid. These people, citizens are volunteering their time, but the money that they would have earned goes toward their city taxes that they owe. And the city taxes will go up because they volunteered their time getting the city up and running and, and have places for the homeless people. So there could be groups of people say, hey, that's a good idea. I will, I will start a group of volunteering to work on these abandoned houses and um, get this up and running to get homeless you know, into smaller apartments and then um, go for that to into um, the older people who can't pay their city taxes and these volunteers will volunteer their time and let that money go toward the older people who can't volunteer the time to pay off the taxes and they owe back taxes. So many people aren't homeless, but they're about to be homeless because of the fact that they can't pay the taxes. And that's when the house is taken away from them because they can't pay the taxes. And if, if people can work off their city taxes and help, the, help get the homes up and running, for homeless people, then you will have less homeless people becoming homeless because the people who can't pay city taxes aren't gonna become homeless because they're volunteering their time to help the city help the homeless, which is also helping them not become homeless. Yeah, and, and Evelyn, you're a bit over your time here, but let, let me just jump in and say, I really like the way you are thinking because you're leveraging what I think is one of the greatest assets this community has, which is a desire to roll up uh, our collective sleeves and help those who are more vulnerable in the community. So I love the idea of encouraging volunteerism to help support our, our homeless population. And I know we do in some regards with regard to some of the uh, emergency camps that we developed during COVID. Uh, I also like the way you're thinking about how to use underutilized resources if there are vacant apartments or mo motel rooms or any other resources that could potentially be brought to bear. Uh, I think you're making a lot of good comments here, and I'm glad that there's representatives of both the Housing Bureau as well as Prosper Portland who listen to this, uh, who I hope are taking good notes. We, we so appreciate your coming in today to share your, your thoughts. Very innovative and much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Next individual, please, Keelan. Item, uh, I think it was 530, if I remember correctly. Request of Joanne Harrigold to address council regarding locating small neighborhood-based transitional housing villages in Portland neighborhoods. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Joanne Harrigold. I live at 3376 Northeast Multnomah Street in Portland. I'm the secretary of the board of a new nonprofit in Portland called We Shine. The mission of We Shine is to develop and operate welcoming, empowering, and safe outdoor shelters in the form of micro villages that serve up to 12 houseless people at a time and are located on uh, either private leased property or public, public land located in residential neighborhoods throughout Portland. Our board of directors consists of individuals with lived experience with houselessness and addiction issues, as well as others with backgrounds in land use planning, project coordination, social services, nursing, and information technology. Several members of our board live and are active in the Kern, Sullivan's Gulch, and Laurelhurst neighborhoods. We are all committed to addressing homelessness with neighborhood-based solutions. In addition to providing sanitation and hygiene services, water and garbage removal at our villages, we will contract with local service agencies to link villagers to, to mental health, addiction, and other ser social services and housing transition support. Neighborhood and faith community volunteers will provide additional support, such as community meals and social, recreational, and community engagement activities. 
the small scale of our micro villages is particularly conducive to serving some of the most vulnerable among the houseless population, such as sexual and gender minorities, racial and ethnic minorities, adults 55 plus with chronic health conditions, and individuals fleeing violence. The small scale will also enhance our ability to, to find sites for our micro villages, even in densely built up neighborhoods on resident sized vacant lots or in parking lots. To date, we have communicated with over 40 property owners in the Kearns, Sullivan's Gulch, and Laurelhurst neighborhoods. And while we have not uh, yet found a lessor, we continue to discuss our proposal with churches and private landowners. In addition, we're actively seeking grant funding from a variety of sources, including the county, the city, and foundations, as well as other donors. We would like to request your support for our efforts by encouraging your staff to meet with us to further discuss our proposal, incentives for property owners, and by keeping us in mind as funding or opportunities to site micro villages arise. I wanna thank you for your time and for all of the work that you all do for the city. Thank you. Hey, thank you, uh, Joanne. And um, Commissioner Ryan, I, I can't speak for him or for his team, obviously, but my suspicion is they would be interested in what you have just proposed. Um, he, he is not here, um, but I will make sure he passes it along. I believe my team would also be interested in hearing what you have. So if, if you have more information, uh, we would certainly like to hear it. Commissioner Hardesty. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, you almost took the words right out of my mouth. I was like, um, I did meet with Reshine a few weeks ago and was really impressed with the thoughtfulness that they, in fact, are taking and thinking about how they can be supportive. And I recommended to them that uh, they should look into the innovative grants um, that we are putting, uh, that uh, Commissioner Ryan is leading around uh, creating these uh, uh, opportunities for our houseless community members all over the city. I do know that we're also uh, gathering a list of publicly owned land. When I talked to We Shine, they were actually uh, working with a private uh, 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 business owner. Um, so I think there's some real opportunities to really be very thoughtful about how uh, we create these opportunities all over the city. So um, thank you, uh, Joanne, for being here today. I, um, just like I think when uh, Commissioner Rubio was gone and we were talking arts and mules, I always feel bad when the commissioner isn't here to hear this fabulous testimony. But I know his staff is here and I know they're taking good notes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joanne, for your testimony. We appreciate it. Uh, next individual, please. Keelan is 531. We are joined by Mike Lindbergh. That is exciting. Request of Mike Lindbergh to address council regarding the South Park Locks Master Plan. Thank you for being here, sir. Mike, you're still muted. Uh, Mike, if you're on the phone, try star six, see if that helps. Sorry about that. No worries. Okay. Good um, morning. Good morning. How exciting for the city council to be approaching the most important debate about downtown parks since the Pioneer Square battle in 1980-81. A vigorous debate shows democracy is alive and well in Portland. The South Park blocks were deeded to the city 175 years ago. Loved by Portlanders all this time, a survey by the Parks Bureau a couple of years ago revealed that 97% of the existing trees are healthy. Since I became involved in this issue nine months ago, I've talked with about 200 people who live by the park, conduct business downtown, or use the park when going to the cultural institutions nearby. Only a couple of people knew that the $46 million rehab of the park was proposed. proposed. Something has been amiss in the public outreach, perhaps due to the pandemic. Shock has been the reaction when I tell people that major changes are afoot. There's broad support for delaying the adoption of a new plan and asking all affected parties to work together to see if a consensus might be achieved. 
Those opposed to the current plan are the Downtown Community Association, Northwest District Association, Southwest Hills Residential League, and also the plan is opposed by the Architectural Heritage Center, Coalition for Historic Resources, and the Tree Emergency Response Team at the Elizabeth Jones Art Center. The group I'm involved with is um, a group of concerned citizens. Uh, frankly, some of the people we receive calls saying that everything that we've claimed about the plan is wrong. Yet this group that I'm a part of, the steering committee alone has a combined 600 plus years of professional experience as leaders in the private sector, government offices, heads of foundations and the scientific community. Each member of our group has spent hundreds of hours walking the park, looking over maps, reading the 130 page master plan, including the 100, 100 page long appendices. In conclusion, if the master plan is adopted, the South Park blocks will be much smaller in size, will be unrecognizable, a shadow of itself, with much less greenery, more concrete, and many fewer trees. The experience that we have today with the majestic canopy would be lost. From the time that Daniel Lounsdale deeded this to the city, to the time that John Charles Olmsted did a park plan for the city in 1903, the plan has been to have a linear park in the central part of downtown. A linear park, which is a green park with trees and grass, not a hard landscape park, which needed to be activated. Uh, in 1952, the parks director, Mr. Buckley, provides a proposed that the elms be taken down, the park be modernized. There was such a public outrage led by John Yon that that plan was dropped. I thank you for your time today, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Thanks, Mike. It's great to hear your perspective. Good to see you. Thank you. Thank you. Next individual, please, Keelan, item 30, 532, please. Request of Wendy Rom to address council regarding the South Park Blocks Master Plan. Good morning, Wendy. She needs to be unmuted. Wendy, uh, you're still muted, if you can hear us. There you are. Can you hear me Hold now? On. Yep, loud and clear. Okay, great. Uh, I'm... Huh. Wendy, are you there? I think she just logged off. Keelan, do you still see her on the list? I don't. Um, I'm oh, there she is. There she is. <laughs> Wendy, you, there you are. Hello, Wendy. Hello, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, okay, I'll start again. Um, I'm Wendy Rom. Uh, thank you for letting me speak uh, about the South Park Blocks Master Plan. As Downtown Neighborhood Association Board Vice Chair and longtime downtown resident, I'll point to concerns in my neighborhood about this plan. Uh, the last census had the DNA area with about 15,000 people. This neighborhood has the densest concentration of affordable and subsidized housing in the city. That's significant that there's enormous economic diversity and 11% are Asian immigrants. I have questions for you before you vote. Why are you considering approving one of Park's largest capital improvement programs when the majority of permanent DNA area residents we hear from oppose it? There is little local support. Most like the park as is. That's a costly disconnect that's hard to understand. Is there an explanation? Before voting, I hope you answer that question for us. Why spend so much to make changes no one nearby wants except one developer? This park works well. It's the east side that needs more investment. Above all, this is a neighborhood park. The New York Times and the Scanner both reported a lack of canopy as an equity issue in poorer neighborhoods. This very neighborhood is on those maps as inequitable and deficient. Many residents live without cars. For them, this is their local and only green park, their backyard. No leafy green single family neighborhood here. Surrounded by glass and concrete, the park is critical for the neighborhood's health and well being. Tall, mature, deciduous trees and greenery impact both mental and physical health. So, why plan for construction that endangers these trees? Who does this plan serve? 
not neighborhood residents. It does serve affluent bikers who live elsewhere and the educated and cultural elite. Who does this plan impact? Those in subsidized housing badly. The fauna and flora with more heat islands as grassy areas are covered with concrete. Permanent neighborhood residents of all economic situations for whom this is the sole green space where they find respite. They're not looking for imposed activation, whatever that is. They want equal access to tree canopy, winter sun, summer shade, and nature. They want the trees properly maintained to prolong their lives as long as possible. Spend money on maintenance, not on cement. Who was left out? Interests of nearby permanent residents, including a large local Chinese immigrant community, retirees, children, the elderly, vets, and those in subsidized housing have been left out. Why isn't the historic nomination preceding this master plan? The DNA will refile the historic nomination today with SHPO. The master plan was just released to the public. My last question is, what is the rush? Thank you for your time and, and for all the work I know you all do. Thanks. Thanks, Wendy. We appreciate your being here and sharing your perspective. Thank you. Keelan, uh, have any items been pulled off of the consent agenda? Two items have been pulled, 536 and 537. 536 and 537. Please call the roll on the remainder of the consent agenda. Hardesty. Maps. Aye. Rubio. Aye. Ryan. Oh, sorry. Wheeler. Aye. The consent agenda is adopted. We'll move to time certains. The first item is time certain number 533, please. Appoint Celeste Carey to the Portland Committee on Community Engaged Policing. Thank you. Colleagues, today we have an opportunity to confirm an appointment to the Portland Committee on Community Engaged Policing, sometimes shortened to PSAP. PSAP serves an independent advisory committee for the city. It has a specific focus on police services and relationships with people living with mental illness, as well as people of color in the Portland community. The Portland Committee on Community Engaged Policing is also charged with overseeing the implementation of the Department of Justice Settlement Agreement. PSAP has led what I would describe as both invaluable and strategic efforts to address our needs and raise solutions when it comes to the health and safety of all members of the Portland community. I wanna thank our PSAP members, all of whom serve as volunteers for their incredible contributions from town halls, to policy and budget recommendations, to panel workshops featuring subject matter experts from different cities across the country. I want to recognize every PSEP member's passion and commitment to making our city better. And if you have not yet had an opportunity to uh, participate in one of the PSEP meetings, I highly encourage you to do so. As one of many of their efforts, PSAP members and staff guided a public process to recruit and vet the appointee before us today, Celeste Carey. And with that, I'll turn it over to the Portland Committee on Community Engaged Policing's Project Director, Theo Lada, to share more. Good morning, Theo. Uh, what a wonderful introduction. Thank you, Mayor Wheeler and uh, Council for holding this space for us today. My name is Theo Lada, and I'm a dad, an Indigenous Portland community member, and a PSEP staff member. Uh, as you all know, PSEP is a group of volunteers who work hard to solicit and disseminate information and to help to improve the relationship between PPB and the community. PSEP is currently working on truth and reconciliation, specifically as it relates to the police, Port Patrol services, and continues to host subcommittee meetings and general meetings with good attendance and input from a variety of different communities. Uh, we also are doing research in collaboration with the university to look at indigenous interactions with police officers, which is the first research of its, research of its kind. Uh, I'm honored to introduce Celeste Carey to you all for appointments to the PSEP. Celeste comes to PSEP with a collaborative nature and years of experience. Uh, 
She's worked in public safety and in, in, in information sharing. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. And Celeste is also on the call. It looks like she has my name, uh, but that's okay. Um, we can share a name for today, but her name's Celeste. Uh, so Celeste, please introduce yourself however you feel is appropriate. And thank you all again. Thank you, Theo. Good morning, council members and public. How are you all doing today? Great, thank you. Good morning. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Theo, for all of your hard work and bringing me forward. I look forward to uh, doing the PSEP committee proud and serving the city. Uh, my main hope, my desire is to help um, create and nurture a, a vital and enduring dialogue um, and a relationship of mutual care and compassion of mutual responsibility and respect uh, for all of our residents, for our police, one that ensures all of us will continue to thrive. And with that, I will put nose to the grindstone, as they say, and get to work. Thank you, Commissioner Hardesty. Thank you, Mayor, uh, and thank you, Theo, for this excellent uh, nominee uh, for PISA. Um, Celeste and I go back uh, a couple of generations, <laughs> a couple of decades, I should say, not generations, we're not quite that old. <laughs> um, but it, uh, your background, uh, Celeste, and plus your connection to community media um, is really something that PSEF will benefit from. Um, your long history of working both with the Crime Prevention Office and your long community history of engaging people um, in community is uh, is uh, really golden when it comes to the work of peace. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, I am so pleased that uh, you are willing to do something else as a volunteer <laughs> to help our community be better. And Theo, um, I continue to be impressed uh, with the candidates that you bring forward. Um, and uh, I know the last time we spoke, you were like, we do not have African-American women represented on this committee. And so it is good to see a city process whereby people identify who's missing and then they go out and seek the very best person they can find. And so, uh, Mayor, I'm happy to accept uh, this nomination uh, as presented to the council. Thank you, Commissioner Hardesty. And if there's no other questions from anyone else, Commissioner Hardesty, would you like to go ahead and make a motion to accept the report? I move uh, we accept the report as presented. Could I get a second, please? Second. Commissioner Rubio seconds. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Keelan, please call the roll. Hardesty. Looking forward to working with you again, Celeste Carey. It will be a pleasure. <laughs> Maps. Um, I can't imagine a more qualified candidate for this position. Um, I'd very much like to thank Ms. Carey for her service to our community. Um, and those are some of the reasons why I vote aye. Rubio. Um, I too uh, can't imagine someone better suited. And Celeste, I just wanna thank you for all the work you've already dedicated to our city um, in your time as an employee. Um, and also in, in service to the community. I mean, you're joining uh, this this uh, committee at, at a critical time in our community, um, and PSEP has played and will continue to play a major role in this work. So I'm really grateful that you'll be adding your experience and your vision to this work, and I look forward to seeing your contribution. Um, I, I again, I just want to say thank you for joining. And I. Wheeler. I want to thank Celeste not only for her time and. Uh, passion and willingness to participate on PSEP, but also for the work that she does on behalf of the city of Portland as a crime prevention coordinator. Thank you for doing that. I'd also like to thank uh, Theo and everybody at PSEP for doing a really thoughtful vetting process that leads to what I think is an outstanding appointment to the PSEP committee. So thank you all for for your, uh, your focus on making sure that we really have top flight candidates coming on board what is a very, very important organization. Uh, Celeste, thanks. We look forward to all of your many contributions going forward. And if there's any way my team can help, let us know. 
I vote aye. The report is accepted. The appointment is approved. Thank you. Thank you. Next item is the regular agenda item 539, a proclamation. Proclaim July 9 through 11, 2021 to be Rose Cup Races Weekend. Thank you to the, oh, uh, Commissioner Maps. Now you're muted. Yeah, um, I'll have some comments on this, but why don't you get us started? Oh, great. Okay, well, thank you to the Portland International Raceway and the friends of PIR for their work to make Portland a destination for the racing community, both regionally and nationally. This year, PIR is celebrating the 60th anniversary of the Rose Cup races. I'm pleased to recognize PIR's tradition of both amateur and vintage racing with this proclamation. But before I read the proclamation, uh, if there are comments from colleagues, and we'll start with Commissioner Maps. Good morning, sir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Let me uh, take a minute and find my comments, if I may. Um, Mr. Mayor, colleagues, um, I'm delighted to join you in declaring July 9th through the 11th, 2021 to be Rose Cup Races Weekend. On those dates, auto fans from across the nation will gather at Portland International Raceway for a weekend of high-speed auto racing. This year's races feature the best amateur drivers from the Oregon Region Sports Car Club of America, the Cascade Sports Car Club, and various vintage race racing sanctioning bodies. Um, the Rose Cup races are part of Portland's Rose Festival, the first Rose Cup race to place at Portland International Raceway in 1961. The Rose Cup has taken place every year since, except for last year. Of course, last year, the Rose Cup races were canceled due to COVID, which is one of the reasons why it is such a delight to welcome the Rose Cup races back to Portland. The return of the Rose Cup is a sign of Portland's recovery from COVID. I hope every Portlander will consider attending this year's Rose Cup races. Uh, they will take place at Portland International Raceway at Delta Park. You can get tickets by going to www.rosecup.com. The tickets range in cost from $5 to $15, and kids accompanied by adults get in free. Gates open up at 7.30 a.m. daily with cars on the course by 8.30 a.m. on Friday and Saturday. We're looking forward to seeing you there, and we're looking forward to welcoming the Rose Cup races back to Portland. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Commissioner Maps. And unless anybody has any comments right now, I'll go ahead and read the proclamation on behalf of the Portland City Council. Whereas Portland International Raceway has been the home of amateur sports car and vintage racing since 1961. And whereas Cascade Sports Car Club of America and the Oregon Region SCCA join forces to continue the racing tradition at PIR. And whereas in 2016, Friends of PIR took over the operation of the event and has worked tirelessly to give the sports car and racing community a place to gather and to compete. And whereas over 200 amateur race drivers from all over the Western United States will venture to PIR for this historic racing event. And whereas the 60th Rose Cup races will also showcase car club corrals, an autocross competition and 60th anniversary historical display. And whereas the 60th Rose Cup races celebrates the finest amateur racing on the entire West Coast, keeping racing alive in our history and in our communities. And whereas the 60th anniversary of this event shall be a celebration of its history and longevity and a movement to continue amateur racing for many years to come at PIR. Now, therefore, I, Ted Wheeler, Mayor of the City of Portland, Oregon, the City of Roses, do hereby proclaim July 9th through 11th, 2021 to be Rose Cup Races Weekend in Portland and encourage all residents to observe this day. Thank you. Next item is 5, 
authority and emergency ordinance. Authorize a settlement agreement between the city and neighbors local 483 granting deferred holiday hours to employees that worked or teleworked between March 17 and March 31st, 2020. Colleagues, in response to the COVID-19 outbreak in March of 2020, the city acted to prioritize the health of employees and we declared a state of emergency at that time. This ordinance grants deferred holiday hours for represented employees who worked or teleworked regular or partial shifts from March 17th to March 31st back in 2020. Labor Relations Coordinator Jamal Anthony is here to present the ordinance. Good morning, Jamal. Good morning, Mr. Mayor. Good morning, Council. It's always a pleasure to see you all. Um, Mary, you did, a, you did a, a fantastic job of teeing this one up. Um, last year, when the uh, pandemic came about us, there's language within the Portland City Labor's um, contract, their labor agreement, that allows for employees that work when the mayor or their designee designates a full city closure that will then provide those employees with deferred holidays. We had a very unique situation by which last year, even into now, that the mayor did not direct um, a full citywide closure, and we had a lot of back and forward with the union. Um, there were a number of employees that were still coming into work during that time. Uh, there was a grievance filed by multiple unions. We had a number of ongoing discussions and the attached, um, the exhibit A that I provided is what we've come to an agreement is that for the Portland city laborers represented employees um, by local laborers 43 that work between uh, the dates of March the 16th through the close of the month, March the 31st, we will provide those um, hours of deferred holiday for our employees for that unique time. Um, the union is in agreement that there was not a citywide closure. Um, and that's, that's what we have. And I'll field any questions that you all may have. Very good. Colleagues, any questions for Mr. Anthony? Commissioner Maps. Does this, uh, I think this is a question for Jamal. Does, does this set a precedent? No, we've had a, we've established with the union, this is on a non-precedent setting basis. And we've also, as recently as this week, um, based on um, after COVID, we immediately had the air quality incidents last year. And I'm pretty sure everyone remembers the, uh, the sun came directly to the city and touched all of us last week. Um, but the union, um, the unions as well as labor relations have identified we need to start some ongoing discussions as to how we deal with these types of incidents. As, um, in the last 18 months, we've had three. Um, and I don't want to get ahead of myself, but we have acknowledged with the unions that we would like to engage in some ongoing discussions about how we address those moving forward and we'll definitely receive guidance from council. Thank you for that clarification. Not a problem. Any further questions on this particular item? Any public testimony, Keelan? No one signed up for this item. All right, this is an emergency ordinance. Please call the roll. Hardesty. Aye. Maps. Aye. Rubio. Aye. Wheeler. Aye. The ordinance is adopted. Thanks, Jamal. Item 541, please. Uh, a non emergency ordinance. Authorize a competitive solicitation and award of three contracts to provide auto body repair services for a five year term and total amount not to exceed $4.5 million. Colleagues, this ordinance authorizes City Fleet to award three price agreements for auto body repair and painting services. Currently, City Fleet procures approximately 170 auto body repairs annually for projects they lack the resources or space to complete themselves. Procuring on a repair by repair basis has slowed the volume of repairs, reduced efficiency, and made it difficult to standardize service quality. A multi-year price agreement will allow City Fleet to repair more vehicles in less time, stabilize pricing, and provide better oversight of vendors performing the work. We have Procurement Manager Scott Schneider here to present the report. Good morning, Scott. Good morning, Mayor and Commissioners. I'm Scott Schneider with Procurement Services. I'm here this morning to recommend that Council authorize the Chief Procurement Officer to enter into three price agreements for auto body repair. These price agreements support city fleet by providing as needed 
uh, auto body repair services for city fleet vehicles. On December 16th, 2020, the city issued a request for proposals, number 1579 for auto body repair services. And on July 14th, four proposals were received. An evaluation committee scored the proposals in accordance with chapter 5.33 of city code and deemed Austin's Body Shop, Professional Auto Body and Paint, and Quality Industrial Refinishers as the most responsive and qualified proposers. Austin's Body Shop and Quality Industrial Refinishers are not certified by the Certification Office for Business Inclusion and Diversity. Professional Auto Body and Paint is certified as a disadvantaged business, a minority owned business, and an emerging small business. All the awardees are in full compliance with all city contracting requirements. If you have any questions about the solicitation process, I can answer those. Also, if you have any questions about this program, Alan Bates from City Fleet is here to answer those as well. Thank you. Colleagues, any questions? Do we have any testimony on this item, Keelan? Someone signed up for this item. Very good. This is the first reading of an auto emergency ordinance. It moves to second reading. Item 542, please. Amend a grant agreement with LifeWorks Northwest to provide $110,000 in additional grant funding through June 30, 2022 for the new options program. Colleagues, item 542 amends the LifeWorks Northwest new options grant agreement to extend through June 30th of 2022. The new options program offers trauma-informed care for adults who need help to exit the sex industry. Their services include substance abuse treatment, mental health treatment, as well as mentoring. This is a proposed one-year extension of the agreement. The not to exceed amount of $110,000 is for program expenses for the period July 1st, 2021 through June 30th of 2022. The grant agreement's total not to exceed amount will be $1,057,000 for program expenses for the period July 1st, 2016 through June 30th, 2022. Funding will come from existing Police Bureau General Fund resources. Lieutenant Franz Schoening from PPB is here to provide additional details. PPB Business Operations Manager Nathan Lamy and LifeWorks Northwest New Options Program Director Ian Schroeder are also present to answer any questions the council may have. Good morning and thank you, Mr. Mayor. First, I'd like to express my appreciation to the entire city council for the opportunity to speak regarding this contract extension and to answer any questions you may have. My name is Franz Schoening. I'm a Lieutenant assigned to the Detective Division in the Police Bureau and one of the units I manage is the Human Trafficking Unit. The Portland Police Bureau's Human Trafficking Unit in its various iterations has worked with the LifeWorks uh, Northwest New Options Program for over a decade. During our investigations into sex trafficking, we generally find that the majority of women and juveniles that we encounter are being compelled or coerced into sex work through physical violence, domestic violence, emotional abuse, substance abuse, mental health conditions, or financial duress. The Human Trafficking Unit's in-house victim advocates assist these women and teens in navigating the external network of social service providers in order to meet their needs. New Options is one of the programs where our advocates refer victims of sex trafficking. New Options is a unique program that provides adult victims of sex trafficking with a variety of services, including mental health services, substance abuse treatment, and mentoring provided by survivors with lived experience. New Options has a high success rate in assisting these women in leaving sex work, managing addictions, and managing mental health conditions, which in turn improves their chances of locating alternative employment, finding stable housing, and restoring custody of children that were removed from them. The statistics for the program are impressive, but the personal stories of survivors that are served by this program and have rebuilt their lives are incredibly impactful. This contract extension before council will provide funding to allow LifeWorks to continue to provide these services for the coming fiscal year. With that, I'm happy to answer any questions council members may have, and I'm joined by Commander Jeff Bell of the Police Bureau's Detective Division, Nathan Leamy from the Bureau's Business Services Group, and Ian Schroeder, who is the Program Director for LifeWorks Northwest New Options. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Commissioner Hardesty. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Lieutenant. Um, my question is simply uh, for this grant, 
what um how many women will be served by this grant and what's been the outcomes for this program and um over the uh, what did you say since 2012 yeah so uh the program serves uh, victims of sex trafficking and its sex worker industry uh, participants who want to leave the, the sex work industry that are referred, either self-referred or referred from a variety of different government agencies. The DA's office will refer people, we refer people. Uh, so the program serves more than just the women that are referred by the human trafficking unit. Uh, I think Mr. Schroeder can probably provide some statistics for how many women have been served. Um, but it's more than just the ones that we encounter in human trafficking. Thank you. I, I guess I was just trying to figure out um, the uh, for the grant, how um, how does it fit into the overall work of Life uh, Works Northwest? And, it, and yeah, so I'm just trying to figure out how that adds value to the work that they're doing. And you've been doing this for a while. So mm -hmm. I, I suspect there's some data about how the outcomes from these, this contract that I could get at a later time. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. No, this is a really good program. I know LifeWorks and they do really good work. I, I, I'm just looking for some data today. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Harsky. Any further questions? If not, Keelan, do we have any public testimony on this item? We have one person who signed up for this item. Great. Caitlin, Caitlin Nissen. All right, welcome. Three minutes, name for the record, please. Hello, can you guys hear me? Yep, loud and clear. Perfect. So hello, my name is Caitlin Neeson, and I would just like to say and give my undying gratitude to the Portland Police Bureau. Through the last couple of years, everything that they have been put through in Portland and the lack of support they've gotten through the city, I'm actually very surprised to hear the Portland City Council actually finally showing some support for this division. Um, with that being said, I just want to kind of share some of my personal experiences living in Southeast Portland and the human trafficking I see right in my own backyard. Um, there is a house near 122nd and Foster that constantly has white vans outside of it. All of the windows are always boarded up and it is clearly a human trafficking hub where people are going in and out and sometimes you don't even see people. You don't even see anyone going in or out of it. And it's 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 very troubling. There was instances in Gresham, Oregon, massage parlors. I've gotten personal documentation myself of going to these massage parlors and how they're all boarded up and they have multiple different signs of, oh, we're a massage parlor, we're an alteration agency. Um, and another instance where I was driving home and there was a, a very young girl, I don't think she was older than 18 years old, she was standing outside by herself in a fur coat, and it didn't look like she even had any pants on or anything like that. In fear that she would have been abducted into the human trafficking industry that is abundant in Portland, I pulled over and asked, do you need any help? Because she, she just looks scared. And this lone female shook her head yes and got into my car with no question. That was extremely terrifying to me because she had no idea who I was and she was still willing to accept help. Luckily, I was able to help her and I was not a predator and I was did not have bad intentions. I was able to help her out with getting food and clothes. And I just felt so helpless in that moment because there's so many people, especially in the homeless community, who are basically undocumented, not necessarily undocumented in the sense of being an immigrant, but in the sense that they have no job, they have no family, and they are huge targets for that. So I think that this $1 million for the year is, is way too low. And we have so many more resources that could go into the Portland Police Bureau to help these people. It's, it's a sad time that we're in. And not to mention, when you go on the Shanghai Tunnel in Portland, Oregon, they actually tell you that the Shanghai Tunnels to this day are used for human trafficking. And how that can actually occur in the Portland city limits without any kind of accountability and that they're just advertising this to the public is, is absolutely shocking to me. There's so much we could be doing. Portland is a huge hub for human trafficking. So I could not be, I could not exclaim my support for this anymore to 112 million percent. So thank you so much for listening to LifeWorks and giving money to the Portland Police Bureau because they deserve it more than any other department in Portland. Thank you so much. 
Caitlin, thank you. We, we appreciate your testimony and thanks for making that extra personal effort to help somebody who is obviously in need. That, that speaks volumes to your character. Thank you. Any other testimony, Keelan? No. Very good. This is a first reading of a non-emergency ordinance. It moves to second reading. Thank you. Thanks, Lieutenant. Thank you. Next item, 543. Temporarily modify and waive portions of city code titles, original art murals, signs and related regulations and planning and zoning to assist businesses, organizations and entrepreneurs to adjust and continue operations during and through the COVID-19 pandemic. Sheila, I can't tell from this new format. Is this a second reading? Uh, yeah, yes, this was past the second uh, reading. Or, um, I'm sorry, it's actually, it was continued. Ah, it's continued. Okay, so Commissioner Ryan is obviously not here. Um, we have taken testimony on this. I would assume then that we are treating this as a second reading, is that correct? Um, yes, Mayor, I believe um, Commissioner Ryan had requested one of his colleagues to announce that this item was going to be rescheduled to a time when he would be present. Ah, okay, that may explain why all these hands are raised. <laughs> Just in case, uh, Commissioner uh, Commissioner Rubio. Um, so item 543 has been rescheduled to July 14th. At 9.30 a.m., I assume? I don't yeah. have that. Yes, yeah. yes, that's correct, on the regular agenda. Okay, I see it. All right, I'm, I'm working with this new format here. I'm still trying to work my way through it. It does say that in the notes. Thank you. So this item is being rescheduled to July 14th at 9.30 a.m. per the commissioner in charge. That's teamwork, everybody. That leaves us to uh, item number 544, a non-emergency ordinance. Approve findings to authorize an exemption for a class of public improvement contracts from the competitive bidding requirements and authorize the use of the alternative contracting method of price agreements for construction services. Commissioner Maps. Um, isn't this a second reading? Uh, it is a second yes, reading. Yes, it is. This is a second reading. Sorry, it's buried down. Yeah, I, I don't know if you guys have seen the new format. It's a little confusing to me. Uh, I'll get it eventually. Second reading, please, for item 544. Is there any additional? Excuse me, Mayor. Commissioner Hardesty. Um, I uh, was under the assumption Commissioner Maps had some um, an amendment that he was going to move forward today. Um, I believe we approved the amendment the last time we considered this uh, item. Did we? I, yeah. I apologize. I know we've talked about this for a while. Yeah, so, it's been okay, bouncing the around. so the amendment stuck in there. Thank you very much. I just wanted to affirm. Um, and could we put on a record so that we are affirming that rather than having this contract uh, run uh, for uh, five years, uh, that we're going to come back in a year with an update. And then in the second year, the council will have to take a proactive approach to continue the contract, assuming that we're having the results that the Bureau believes they can achieve under this proposal. Is that an accurate assessment of the amendments that you and I discussed? In uh, yes, Commissioner, that's what the uh, amendment says. Thank you very much. Just wanted to make sure that was on the record. All right, very good. Any further questions? Seeing none, please call the roll on the ordinance as amended. Artisty. Aye. Maps. Aye. Rubio. Aye. Wheeler. Aye. The ordinance is adopted. Back to the consent agenda. Item number 536, I believe, was the first item that was pulled. 536, amend intergovernmental agreement with Multnomah County Department of Community Justice for an additional $375,000 to hire at-risk youth for outdoor maintenance and landscape services. And that's Commissioner Maps. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, colleagues. Um, the item before us today um, authorizes an amendment to an intergovernmental um, 
agreement with the Multnomah County Department of Community Justice. The Water Bureau partners with Community Justice on two programs, an adult program, which provides an alternative to jail through community service, and a juvenile justice program called Project Payback. Today's ordinance deals with Project Payback. The Project Payback program is administered by Multnomah County, which recruits and hires at-risk youth to provide ground maintenance and landscape services to the Water Bureau sites across the city. The Water Bureau has worked with Project Payback uh, successfully for over 25 years. The Project Payback program provides on-the-job training to at-risk kids. Project Payback is both an environmental protection program and a restorative justice program. This partnership aligns with both the Water Bureau's strategic plan and our equity plan. Today, we have guests uh, from the Water Bureau and perhaps Multnomah County who will share a presentation on this ordinance. Uh, let's begin by welcoming staff from the Water Bureau. We have Chris Warner, uh, Director of Operations for the Water Bureau and Dan Allison, uh, Water Operations Manager at Water. Uh, Chris, Dan, thank you for joining us today. Uh, Commissioner Hardesty, did you have a question up front? Uh, thank you, Mayor. I asked to have this item pulled off consent, and I just had some very specific questions. If other uh, of my colleagues don't have questions, I just had questions um, that I, I was hoping to get answered before we voted on this matter. But um, I didn't need a formal presentation. I just had some very specific questions. Commissioner Maps, you're thinking. Uh, sure, uh, Commissioner Hardesty, we'd love to hear your questions, and I think we have uh, plenty of staff who can address your concerns. Thank you so much. And I did let Commissioner Maps know that I wanted to pull this item, and the, the my questions is really around the at-risk youth, and whether and whether or not um, uh, uh, the youth. Uh, this question came up in my office about whether or not um, youth are safe. Right when we talk about at-risk youth uh, traveling around a city doing public works processes, they're in communities that may not be safe for them, and so just wanted to get some sense for, like the protocol and uh, whether or not there have been any issues around um, young people feeling unsafe um, in the work environments that they've been asked to work in. I'll kick it over to staff. Um, good morning, uh, Mayor Wheeler and City Council members. Uh, my name is Chris Warner, Director of Operations for Water Bureau. Before I kick it over to Dan Allison, our City Operations Manager, uh, I did just want to mention, Commissioner Hardesty, that uh, from the Water Bureau's perspective in working with this program for decades, uh, we have never had any issues of safety come up because there are significant safety protocols in place particularly for all of our locations. So um, with that, I, I think uh, to better answer those questions though, we will turn it over. We do have a couple of representatives from Multnomah County's this program with us, but I'll hand it over to Dan Allison. He can give a, a quick overview of how, the, how we have partnered with Clark, uh, Multnomah County on this and some of the areas in which they work for us. So Dan, please take it over. I'm not seeing Dan. Is Dan on the call? He may not be. So um, I know that uh, uh, Dina Corso with the with the county is with us. So Dina, if you could please describe some of the uh, safety considerations that go into this uh, long running program of collaboration between the city and the county. Thank you, Chris. And actually, for the, the that level of detail, the orientations and the protocols, I actually would like to ask. Um, our community justice manager, Darren Peter, to speak to those. But just for the record, my name is Dina Corso, and I am the Juvenile Services Division Director for Multnomah County's Department of Community Justice. And Darren, I think, can answer the specific how, what sort of safety protocols the, the youth receive uh, when they arrive at the job sites. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, good morning. I'm the community justice manager for Project Payback and also community service on the adult side. And yes, we've been working um, always ebbing and flowing and 
listening to uh, clients, listening to the JCCs about safety. That's one of our number one um, focuses. And we try to uh, have risk levels go out in the same van, so medium, high risk. Uh, we also take into account maturity level. So 14-year-old male, we would try to keep him with a 15-year-old male, not an 18-year-old male, right? We try to be really cognizant of influences and um, vulnerabilities, right? So we're very, very on top of that. In addition to we created right before COVID hit, um, a female-only crew uh, wanting to take into account safety. There's different needs there. There's different... Um, levels of safety there in all in all ways. Um, so we're always taking that into account, listening to what the clients need, listening to what the JCCs need for this to be, you know, so successful. It's been very successful for what, two plus decades. And um, we're always into meeting the needs of the clients as, as, as the needs change. I hope that answered the question. Um, that thoroughly answers my question. And I thank you all uh, for making time to be here today. Um, again, um, the program uh, has been around for a couple of decades, so clearly it's doing good work. And it was really important for me to just find out what the, what the safety protocols were, and you've given me a really good sense of what that, what, what that looks like. Um, and I'm happy to hear, knock on wood, that there's been no incidents at all. Um, um, uh, around uh, the safety protocols not uh, working. Uh, so thank you. And thank you, Commissioner Maps. I appreciate you uh, bringing the right people to answer my very specific questions. Thank you. Very good. Any further questions? And is there any testimony on this, Keelan? No one signed up for this item. All right. It's a first reading of a non-emergency ordinance. It moves to second reading. Thank you. And that leaves us with 537, please. Authorize the Director of the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability to execute a grant agreement with SOLVE in the amount of $750,000. Commissioner Rubio. So colleagues, we had this item originally on consent agenda given the work we've done with the mayor's office in executing this grant. And this uh, is a SOLVE contract and it was a carryover from last year's spring bump. And the grant to solve would be directed towards cleanup services around the city. And this is in connect connection to projects um, connected to a broader effort spearheaded by Mayor Wheeler and his staff um, with the grant being administered by BPS. And the Bureau has received um, the necessary FTE support to execute this grant. Um, both our offices and BPS are in agreement that this grant be executed in collaboration with Black, Indigenous, and people of color centered and community based organizations doing similar work. This was also expressed an expressed intent and interest by members of this council because we've seen that historically community cleanups have traditionally focused in certain communities or have left out some of our most highly populated diverse neighborhoods. Um, so we also expect to keep a close eye on this item as it's being administered by BPS. Um, so I'll, I'll turn it over to Mayor Wheeler and his staff uh, to speak more about the intent and goals of the grant. And then we also have uh, Donnie uh, from BPS here to any, answer any further operational questions as well, as well as uh, field questions from our colleagues. Yeah, I think, thank you, Commissioner Ruby. I, I'd like to just make a couple of comments here. First of all, the City Council approved this funding for SOLVE to support community-led cleanups across the city uh, during our efforts around the fall bump. With this particular grant, SOLVE is going to be engaging volunteers to carry out high impact cleanups across Portland, particularly focusing on areas where underserved and underrepresented communities are most impacted by accumulated trash and debris. SOLVE has, as you know, extensive experience leading and supporting volunteer cleanup efforts, not only in Portland, but indeed all across the state of Oregon. In addition to leading their own events, they also support community groups, neighborhood associations, businesses, and a host of other nonprofits and organizations who would like to host cleanup events. They provide training, supplies, disposal, as well as other assistance on a case-by-case -case basis. 
Between January and May of this year alone, SOL volunteers have picked up over 116,859 pounds of trash during 187, 187 different cleanup events. Over the last weekend of June, SOL's Pick It Up Portland cleanup event engaged over 1,500 volunteers who picked up over 14,000 pounds of trash at 26 different project sites across the city. It was fun uh, and I was pleased that my team participated. This grant will expand SOL's capacity to lead more high impact volunteer cleanup events, respond to increasing requests for cleanup events and the many community members and organizations who want to volunteer their time and energy to help clean up the city. This grant will enable SOLVE specifically to hire additional staff, build new community partnerships with organizations serving underrepresented, underrepresented and underserved communities, including houseless community members and BIPOC Portlanders, enhance their outreach and acquire the supplies and services needed to implement volunteer cleaning up sites. Questions? And we have- uh, Yes, Mayor, I was under the impression there was gonna be a presentation made about this program, was that it? Uh, this was pulled off consent. So I, I had prepared any presentation, but I do note that we have Chris Carrico from Solve. She's also here to answer any questions, specific questions people might have. So my, I guess, uh, Mayor, my question is more around how this grant is supporting all the other cleanup efforts uh, that are working. I guess I'm, I'm just concerned about how this grant uh, came together and, uh, and, um, and whether or not we are making sure that we're not duplicating efforts. I know as I go to talk to many neighborhood associations that they are doing weekly cleanups in their communities, but they're not getting resources to do those cleanups. I know that there are, uh, we have a, a, a hucker that is doing a lot of cleanups as well. I'm just concerned that there seems to be a lot of desperate, uh, disparate efforts that are taking place to do the same thing. Um, my folks started, my staff were attending your green action tables and then they no longer were invited. So I'm just trying to get a sense of where these decisions are made and how they're being coordinated with other efforts that are being, that are taking place around the city uh, to keep the city clean. Um, so I'll call on Amanda Watson from my staff. I, I'm not sure why your staff would be excluded. I think people are welcome to come to those, particularly city staffers, uh, but I'll look into that. Uh, Amanda, are you on? Yes, thanks, Mayor, and thank you for the question, Commissioner Hardesty. Um, your staff were, uh, received the invitation and, and um, reminders for the meetings, and I did clarify, I don't know if we had a, an email issue or something, but definitely um, your staff and other council staff have always been welcome um, to attend the Cleaning Green Action Table meetings, and we've appreciated their contributions in the meetings that they did attend. Um, so part of the answer to that question is that the Cleaning Green Action Table um, is a space where we're, we are working to coordinate all of these different um, cleanup efforts, right? So among the various city bureaus that do cleanup efforts, you mentioned impact reduction program with OMF, parks is involved, um, PBOT, you know, the street cleaning um, and abandoned vehicles work um, and others, um, in addition to our agency partners like ODOT, um, TriMet, um, Metro, um, and then the various community organizations, neighborhood associations, community groups, SOLVE and others that are working on the volunteer um, cleanup effort. So this is the table where we're trying to bring folks together in the same space to understand who's doing what where, what additional resources are needed, um, and really bring more coordination to that effort. So we know there's a lot of people involved in this space and wanting to get involved in this space and want to make sure we're, um, we're effectively coordinating. Um, so on this particular um, effort and how it, it complements the other one, so SOLVE um, has agreed to play the leading role in coordinating the volunteer efforts. So um, and what makes SOLVE such a great partner for this is their model of supporting other cleanups. So in addition to leading their own events, SOLVE staff will lead um, volunteers in SOLVE-led events 
they also provide to support to organizations that want to hold their own cleanup. So, you know, often neighborhood associations, as you mentioned, Commissioner, um, hold their own events and SOLVE can provide um, support with the cleanup supplies, with kind of basic training for volunteers about how to safely carry out a cleanup um, with uh, event recruitment, right? So putting a, a link up and a, a recruitment on SALT's website um, and uh, covering part of the disposal costs. So we know that disposal um, is a challenge for, for community-led cleanups. And so part of what this grant will do is provide additional resources for SALT to be able to, um, to cover more of the, the dumpsters costs um, where that's needed and to have the contracted services for disposal at the end of cleanup events, um, recognizing that's a need and that we need to do more of that. Um, so I hope that answers uh, your question. Um, um, uh, Chris is also on the call to, to I'll let her kind of chime in um, as, our, as our expert and representative from SOLV here, and um, if there's more that she wants to add to that. Thank you, Amanda. And again, um, SOLV does good work around the state. My question is more as the elected, one of the elected officials that are responsible for the resources that we distribute. I, uh, when I don't have enough information to know how this came about, and my staff tells me that they've not been invited. Uh, they were they are not getting invitations to meetings so that they could be informed about this process. And then it showed up um, on a consent agenda. So I wanted to take time to learn more about the city's process and how are you going to share that information with the rest of the elected leaders who have a responsibility to ensure that these these dollars are spent wisely and we're not duplicating efforts. Because again, this is the first time I've heard any details about this green program. And as a city council member, I'm not feeling like I have enough information to know whether we're duplicating efforts, whether we're coordinating well. And that's why I pulled this item. I have a question to this point, because this, this has come up previously, Commissioner Hardesty. Um, no item makes it onto the consent agenda without being discussed. At the uh, at the council level briefings, your your staff participates in those, don't they? Uh, are you referring to the chief of staff meeting? Uh, yes, my 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 staff participates in those meetings. And they um, they did and let you know that this was on the consent agenda, did they not? They did let me know, and and they and I and they asked questions as it was being put on a consent agenda. So these aren't new questions that I have. These are just simply questions I've been trying to get answered, and I have not been able to. All right. Well, this this is the first I've heard that your staff has not participated in the tables because I believe they have been invited. They started. Um, there's again, right. Okay, I mean, if, if there's some miscommunication there, I, I, I don't think we need to take a lot of the public's time to sort that out. I think we can work at that at the staff level. So I'd ask my chief of staff to work with your chief of staff. And if there is a, uh, if there's a miscommunication at some point in the chain here, let's get that solved. Commissioner Maps. Um, just for a point of clarification, and I'll throw this over to staff, maybe Amanda might be the right person. When did we approve this um, money? Thanks, Commissioner Maps. This was approved in the spring bump process. Um, and as Commissioner Rubio noted in her opening remarks, approved with a carryover. Um, so that's why it's coming to council after the, the fiscal year, but we recognize we needed some more time for the, the contract, uh, or sorry, the grant agreement um, administrative process. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Concludes my questions, Mayor. Very good, thank you, Commissioner Hardesty. Anything else, Commissioner Rubio? I see your hand is still raised. Yes, I, um, I just wanna note that Donnie from BPS is here and he um, can maybe talk a little bit about the implementation and what we're doing on the ground um, so far, just to give a bigger picture. And then um, maybe we should definitely talk um, later about how we do pull or how we are tracking all these um, efforts moving forward. Um, I would be interested in having that conversation just to you know, have that big look at the city um, and that we can keep track and um, it can perhaps lead to um, you know, um, ways to address any, any gaps that we see um, or to pull in better coordination. Um, so uh, I wanna invite Donnie. Donnie, are you on the phone? Are you on the phone? Yeah, thanks commissioner. Uh, Donnie Oliver, Deputy Director of BPS for the record. 
Uh, Commissioner Hardesty, uh, to address the question about coordination, you're, you're absolutely right. There are a lot of um, moving parts that we wanted to um, acknowledge. And one of the things that also came apart as part of the budget, and we were very grateful for council doing is uh, also authorizing an FTE to help coordinate all these, these moving parts. In addition, we're, we're gonna be relaunching the community cleanup events. Uh, again, that was their neighborhood focus to again, provide more resources. Then of course we have the Large American Rescue Plan Act uh, proposals that are out there and all this is to suggest that we're putting a lot of resources to the issue uh, that our communities are asking us to address, which is the uh, cleanliness and beautification of, of Portland. So I just, we're acknowledging that there's a lot going out and we wanna uh, do it well and coordinate it. Uh, Quentin Bauer, who has been leading the efforts for many of our, our bureaus um, and working with your offices is also um, on the call to uh, answer specific questions. But I would just ask Commissioner Hardesty um, that uh, if you have specifics about this, we're happy to answer um, about how BPS is approaching this, not just this particular $750,000 tranche for assault, but also the other components that we're, we're launching in FY21-22. There's no shortage of need, and we hope that the resources that we have allocated are efficient or sufficient, excuse me. Uh, th uh, thank you, Donnie, uh, for that. I guess I do have a question about the amount of staff people that we're hiring at SOL for this could, program. Could I, could I suggest this before we jump? We we have Chris Carrico on the line from Solve. Uh, let's let's let her in on this conversation as well. We're talking about her and her organization. Uh, Chris, good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Mayor. I appreciate it. And thank you to the commissioners for, for having me and considering this. So SOLVE has been incredibly busy over the past few months, as the mayor had reported, and we're looking forward to continuing this work. Um, being a part of the Clean and Green Action Table has been really helpful in coordinating the efforts across the city. Uh, there is a lot of people that are trying to do the work, but we've been really, uh, it's been nice to have everybody at the table and to be able to be more coordinated with our efforts. Um, and two of the other co-chairs I wanted to mention, they aren't here today, but two of the co-chairs of the Clean, Clean and Green Action Table are two gentlemen who are co-founders of the um, organization called Leaders Become Legends. And they are one of our key partners in getting the work done. They are, um, it's an organization that mentors uh, uh, young men of color in uh, different resources in everything from mental health to finding jobs and to navigating their life outside of uh, incarceration or um, you know, sort of hurdles that they have. And they will be one of our primary partners of getting this done. A good portion of the budget is earmarked towards them and the work that they're doing primarily in East Portland. So I'm really excited that they want to take part in this. And so I wish that they were able to join us, but they're not. Um, and then Commissioner Hardesty, I, I really appreciate your comments on uh, working with BIPOC community and the underserved community. We had an event on uh, Saturday at 92nd and Clinton that just happened to be adjacent to Cascadia Mental Health uh, Housing. And they, uh, the residents came out and thanked us and were clapping because it was the first time anybody had ever come out to address this uh, illegal dump site that was gathering at the end of their cul-de-sac. So that's the work that we're looking to do. We really want to make an impact. This isn't just about beautification of Portland. This is about helping the underserved and underrepresented people who don't necessarily have a voice. And we are trying to make their lives better. And we really are pushing to do more work in these communities. So while yes, a lot of our work is done in downtown, we really are focusing these high need events in uh, areas that aren't being placed up. So um, these gentlemen told us that they had been asking for, for uh, about a year to have this area cleaned up and it wasn't getting done. So I'm excited that we're able to do that. Um, and we are bringing on new staff. We were, uh, this is a big expansion to our program. So many of the events that we're doing aren't the, our typical model, which is a volunteer led event. These aren't events that we want our volunteers just going out to by themselves. They are staff led event. There's a lot of biohazards, there's a lot of risks. So we are taking a more active role in proactively identifying these locations so that we can get out there and safely make a difference in these neighborhoods. So that's why the staffing has been bumped up to this. So, uh, but I'm really excited. This has been such an honor to be a part of this and to be a part of the solution. So I'm excited to be leading an organization that's making a big difference in our city right now. Happy to answer any questions because this is, this is important work. Thank you, Chris. Commissioner Hardesty. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, thank you, uh, Chris. Um, I don't have any, I didn't have any questions for Solve from the beginning. I know Solve, uh, based on their statewide uh, reputation and the good volunteer cleanups that they do around the state. So my questions, again, were more city questions than they were Solve questions. 
Uh, thank you, Commissioner Hardesty. And I, I think I've solved the problem. We were told that Andre Miller on your staff was the contact for our tables. Andre has received all of the invitations as well as the reminders. Um, so it could be that there's some miscommunication there or we may have the wrong contact on your staff. We'll get that sorted out. I appreciate that. And um, again, thank you, uh, Chris, for uh, being here today and all the staff who's working on this. Um, this is about uh, oversight and accountability for the city were my questions. So thank you all. Thank you. Any further discussion on this particular item? And this is an emergency ordinance. So uh, I'll ask, oh, Commissioner Rubio, uh, but Keelan, while Commissioner Rubio is speaking, could we also find out if there's anybody who'd like to testify? Commissioner Rubio? I also want to just offer to that, uh, Commissioner Hardesty, I'm open to working with you about looking at those gaps and then coming back if we need to look at additional um, uh, funds to outreach to those that have been, that you, that have been left out of this effort. I'm happy to work with you on that. Thank you, Commissioner Rubio. Yes, I. Uh, if we get a better communication line, I think all of this will be better. Uh, the outcomes for our community, and we wouldn't be spending all this time today having this conversation. Um, and again, my my folks have not been getting the notices for the meetings because they told me that was so. So we will fix that. Well, Commissioner Hardesty, I will send you the information that we sent to your staff, and you will see it, and you will see that we did provide that information to your staff. I agree with Commissioner Rubio, this is not the time or the place to continue to discuss it. Am I having, I'm not discussing it, okay. I'm done. I said this was the reason we were having this conversation today. Very good. Is there any public testimony on this item, Keelan? No one is on the call. Please call the roll. Hardesty. Aye. Maps. Aye. Rubio. Aye. Wheeler. Aye. The ordinance is adopted and we are adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Recording stopped.